Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and friends, on behalf of the European Association of Professors Emeriti, I will give a research contribution to understanding the needs, the wishes of young and old people. A second lecture will be given by my friend Robert from New York. Let me start with a narrative on the reality of life. In 2012, I looked after 25 transplanted patients for two weeks at a rehabilitation camp in the beautiful Austrian Alps. During a breathtaking mountain hike, I asked a young patient I already knew well, who had joined my walk for a while, would you tell me a little about your lifestyle and your purpose in life? She replied, it's life, but not the kind of life you imagine it to be. And that was all she said. And I was left speechless. My Austrian experience reminded me of a quote by Albert Schweitzer, the famous philosopher. I am life that wants to live in the midst of life that wants to live. After returning home to Hanover, I got in touch with the Research Institute for Philosophy in Hanover and started a loose but fruitful collaboration on the implications of complexity, systems thinking and philosophy for pediatric nephrologists. My presentation today is based on these long-standing activities between 2012 and 2024. It's about the need of young people with chronic kidney diseases, CKD, to search for a purpose in their own lives and the meaning of humanity's existence and to realize it through a balance of body, mind and spirit. My video presentation introduces you to this EAPE research project which distinguishes between healthy and sick people, patients and caregivers, standard scientific findings of medicine, philosophy, psychology and sociology, and the influences of a new epochal enlightenment. According to the article by Michael Biggs in the EAP Bulletin in 2023, one of the immediate challenges of such an interdisciplinary research is to find appropriate voices and a team of discussions, distinguishing between the needs, requirements, demands, necessities and the wishes, wants, desires, longings, fantasy, dreams and utopias of young and old people involves both language and an intellectual perspective from which to deploy it. This is my first point to remember. The vocabulary or meaning potential of our current language needs to be clarified in order to explain the new aspects of our research project. What did I find out about the interplay of body, mind, spirit and matter, organic and anorganic matter? I went back as to 1855 in the Punch publication, what is matter? Never mind. What is mind? No matter. 100 years later, Nicholas Humphrey published, What is mind? No matter. What is matter? Never mind. They are fun, such paradoxes. But to what extent two paradoxes matter? Matter and experience appear to us as a qualitatively different hints, hence, Descartes believe that mind, our experimental self, and matter are distinct and of different nature to each other. This is the philosophical tenet of dualism, which asserts that the human mind is essentially immaterial and disembodied. I firmly believe that the interplay between matter, technology for instance, mind, spirit and body matters when we want to analyze needs and wishes. 
I know from so many congresses that the meaning of words and terms can be lost in translation. For example, the English word mind does not exactly mean the same as the German Geist or the French Esprit. Here are four lyrics on the power of love, translated into four languages, resulting in four types of love. Let's start with Latin. Nulla unda tam profunda, quam vis amoris furibunda. Very deep love. Then from Goethe in German. Keine Quelle, so tief und schnelle, als der Liebe reißende Welle. Oh, that's a rather loose love. Now translated by deep link into English sounds like this. No source so deep and fast as love's captivating power. Moreover, when I use artificial intelligence in order to translate this into French, it reads, Il n'y a pas de source plus profonde, plus rapide que la vague déchaînée de l'amour. Ah, oh, l'amour française. What do we know about the interplay of wishes, aspirations, expectations? wants, requests, free will, desires, longing, fantasies, dreams, utopias. How do the mind, spirit, soul, subjectivity, feelings and the unconscious interact? Robert and I have therefore decided to explore the topics of mindfulness and spirituality at the center of our two video presentations to explain our EAP e-research project. More on terminologies. I feel a challenge when people speak about needs, wishes and necessities. In the psychological literature, wishes are often understood as a subjective attitude, in contrast to necessity as an objective factor, when needs have arisen that must be satisfied. What do I know about the vocabulary on needs, requirements, demands and necessities? Here is an incomplete list of fundamental needs that are established by different sciences. Protection, participation, equity, freedom. It's a matter of legal sciences. Perceiving, thinking, believing, communicating. It's the job of humanities, philosophy, psychology, sociology, theology. Technology is certainly the matter of natural sciences. Neonatal and palliative care. That's our job as doctors. Nutrition must be concerned as a necessity with certain social economic, cultural and psychological implications of food and eating. That's a complex challenge which obviously mankind has not solved in the affluent societies. I'm worried about the limited role of philosophy in medicine. Apart from medical ethics, the role of clinical philosophy, clinical philosophy, in the medical network has so far been very small. The questions arise as to whether this lack of integration of philosophical perspectives, terminology and activities contributes to deficits in the healthcare system. This is my second point to remember. How could clinical philosophy lead to new approaches in healthcare services? I want to give you an example for the role of everyday language and moral norms in medicine. Chronically sick or disabled patients and physicians feel a challenge when speaking about understanding sexual desires. Young and old patients with long-term diseases go through hormonal changes. They continue developing relationships and persistent curiosity about sex and romantic relationships. It is essential for the patient's families and physicians to know that these feelings and needs are completely normal and are experienced by all patients worldwide. To what extent might patients feel that they are left alone with their sexual desires? We want to find out. A major problem in the doctor-patient conversation is not only finding the right words, terms and atmosphere, but above all, coping with the patient's silence and concealment of subjective feelings. This is my third point to remember. What is the role of evidence-based medicine and narrative-based medicine? We want to find out. Here is an example for the role of complex system thinking 
in medicine. Our past president Natale de Santo wrote, the potential of complexity is explored along with new techniques and a wider use of artificial intelligence, as well as the links with philosophy, systems biology, systems medicine, and systems pharmacology. I strongly believe in the important role of a strategic alliance between young and old people. In her lecture, Why Children Need Older People in Their Lives and How Children Can Support the Elderly, Katarina Gaziova pointed out the needs and desires of children, adolescents and seniors, and the necessity of their mutual relationships. She quoted herself, Human beings die because they are unable to connect the beginning with the end. In other words, childhood with old age. The quote means that clever people knew already very long ago that human life would be longer and more pleasant if children and older people were closer to each other. We want to create more understanding for the needs of young and old people and their care. What is the need for material and non-material things in civilization and in the nature of our universe? What's important? What has priority in care? And what should we pay attention to? In the scientific literature, the term caring is often understood as a subjective attitude, whereas general significance and importance are often contrasted as objective or even systemic factors of care. According to this view, the importance of a challenge would therefore determine whether it is appropriate to take care of the matter or not. So, should one primarily only care about important things, but not about unimportant things? The philosopher Harry Gordon Frankfurt argued that caring by itself about a thing or about people makes needs important. When a person begins to care about something, the thing becomes important to them, even if it was not important before. The caring attitude for another person brings with it a need to act. Because of this need to act, the well-being of the person in need can be positively influenced and, under certain circumstances, it can not only benefit the individual, but for society as a whole, in the sense of positive emergence. Human care therefore means taking responsibility for other people. This is the topic of our EAP research project, Needs and Wishes. What about the wishes of young and old? Are wishes less important than needs? I'm answering this question by arguing that my own material or non-material desires gain their priority in relation to things or people through my individual relationships to these two types of desires. An inner mental or emotional need leads to a desire that wants to be satisfied. Because it will maintain the balance of body, mind and spirit, without which a person cannot feel well. Desires are not only aimed at the fulfillment and satisfaction of their own needs, but also those of others. Depending on their necessity, the fulfillment of desires can therefore not only have a positive influence on the well-being of individuals, but also gain positive influence for the whole. How about priorities? Priorities in the context of needs and wishes of young and old people means the following. First, prioritization means talking about the next and not the father's challenge. Second, with regard to healthcare services, each nation must define its own priorities and responsibilities concerning the abolishment of deplorable states of social affairs. Three, setting priorities means to decide on what must be done first and what can wait and when it's time to act. Four, priority means clarifying who takes responsibility for the action, individual, national or international social responsibility. Five, priority setting includes an either or decision as well as a choice between three or more alternatives. Six, 
priority setting means answering the question of where and how nominated experts can most effectively use their capacity and what the expected benefits will be. 7. Priority means clarifying how it can be ensured that vulnerable and disadvantaged individual people and groups in the society can reach the 50th centile of a quality of life and health scale of a national population. Can needs and wishes be both rational and irrational? Could young and old people with chronic illnesses answer this question? I really don't know, but I want to know. What are the needs and wishes of young and old sick people? Why are these two age groups the subject of our EPA research project needs and wishes? My answer is young and old sick people are the most vulnerable part of the population. Let me now present some details of part one of our two surveys on the needs and wishes of young and old sick people. Our stratification is based on the selection of a small group of young patients who fulfill the criteria of a well-defined type of model. We want to know how subjective, objective and systemic factors are interacting during medical care in young patients with severe long-term kidney diseases, including dialysis and kidney transplantation. Why did we choose patients with severe long-term kidney diseases? Just because we are nephrologists and because we are interested in philosophy. What are the needs and wishes of young and old sick people and their caregivers? That's what we also want to know. We, why, why do we want to know how doctors reconcile their own individual needs and wishes with those of their patients? Pediatric nephrologists offer various renal replacement therapies that do not make their patients completely healthy. They enable them to survive in the long term, but not to lead an uncomplicated normal life. We want to know how subjective, objective and systemic factors interact when patients and pediatric nephrologists spend many years together. I have followed my oldest patients for 46 years. Part one of the EPA research project is entitled Survey on Needs and Wishes of Young Patients with Chronic Kidney Disease, CKD, and of the Caring Pediatric Nephrologists. Our, our working hypothesis is the needs and wishes of patients and the balance of body, mind and spirit in pediatric nephrology are poorly understood. These hypotheses are supported by own previous activities, earlier surveys of ESPN, that's the European Society for Pediatric Nephrology, and own publications in the EAPE Bulletin, Pediatric Nephrology Journal, and Francher's Pediatrics. I want to inform you now about 10 major points concerning patients and methods of our project and study. Patients will be selected by their caring nephrologists. We will use and include questionnaires for patients and nephrologists. We will use narrative, narratives for patients and nephrologists. We have to use statistics. There's a need for an ethical committee of EAPE and ESBN. Our time schedule is 2024. To 2025. Our team consists so far of EAPE members and more than 50 cooperating pediatric nephrologists from 48, 48 European countries and the US. Till now no funding was required but we have to see in the future if we should apply for sponsoring. Last but not least it will be a joint project of EAP and ESPN. The questionnaires will be analyzed by Bob and Joe. The narratives will be analyzed by Joe, Bob and a team of psychologists, philosophers and theologists. 
EAPE and ESPN members are cordially invited to participate. Please contact me. The main discussion points will be the role of balance of body, mind and spirit in young patients with CKD and in pediatric nephrologists. The first steps for a third enlightenment in medicine will be planned to establish a closer interdisciplinarity between medicine, natural sciences and humanities resulting in a pioneering explanatory framework. What is not included in our project will not deal with the terminology around esoteric medicine, alternative medicine, complementary medicine, integrative medicine and all their other modalities shown here on this slide. What are our expected conclusions? The EAPE project needs and wishes follows the function within our defined framework of reporting on the fundamental conceptual decisions which do not result which do not result from a purely argumentative and theoretical basis but from practical life world experiences and the life stories of individual patients and doctors. What's the outlook? We hope to become pioneers in a new explanatory framework that will be tested in 2025 in a follow-up survey in old patients with CKD. The new topic will include these issues relating to the needs and wishes of old people, including their views about palliative care and assisted dying, religious spirituality and sexuality. Interested people should contact me. What are the priorities of our research project? We must make a case for the necessity, benefit and feasibility of our project. This means that existing concepts from some disciplines are mobilized to gain a point of view from which a knowledge gap can be identified. In addition, it demands that approaches, techniques and methods are identified to address the knowledge gaps. So, how could we identify this potential in EAPE and in ESPN? I propose a structural strategy of what should be happening. The content of the field will be described by us in web seminars with interested colleagues. And once we turned all single challenges upside down, we can tell whether we already have all the pieces together and where pieces are missing. I would like to add a word of respect. As interdisciplinary researcher, I may have acted as the disruptor of current attitudes within EAP. I eventually opened eyes to another way of arranging the pieces in which there are gaps rather than completeness. I know that this is a point where the intellectual discomfort and negative reaction had already arisen among a few members of EAPE. Upcoming new perspectives are often rejected by those who are satisfied with the original way of describing the world. My new point of view wants to rearrange concepts, to reveal that there is an inadequacy in healthcare services that EAPE can critically address. This is not simply restricted to medicine. It includes natural sciences and humanities disciplines. In all sciences, paradigm shifts reveal ways of thinking and suggest new perspectives that are difficult to describe. These organizational limitations are much more profound than simply the need for financial funding, workforce and additional technical vocabulary. In conclusion, the crisis of European healthcare delivery systems calls for a new enlightenment and more cooperation between philosophy and medicine. 
humanities bring the moment of conditio humana, which allows first to identify I, socially desirable goals for the future, and then to find appropriate means to achieve them. The power of change, the power to change and overcome crises must come from a combination of individual and collective faith in what is just, good and true, and courage to act on it. Finally, a philosophical word of caution. Our project can be accused of suffering from the paradox of Socratic ignorance. How to know that you know nothing? We are well aware to, of the endless discussion loops that could arise among doctors and to a lesser extent philosophers. If Socrates were alive today, he would surely admit that his statement is not applicable to natural sciences such as mathematics and physics. But how about medicine? If Hippocrates were to join Socrates today, he would probably say to him, what you are really saying is that doctors can never really know anything for sure. Doctors and their patients can have beliefs and opinions, but they can never know for sure whether they are fact or fiction. As long as doctors search for truth, values and ethics, they are well on the way to fulfilling my Hippocratic oath. Thank you very much for your attention.